Hey everybody, Tyree here with Before I Forget, along with Kevin. Say hey, Kevin. <laughs> hey, uh, Kevin. <clears throat> and we have Miss, or I'm sorry, Major Sydney Jacks back. back <laughs> I'm fucking up already. Yeah. Hey. I mean, <laughs> miss works too, right? Miss Major. I mean, yeah, but Miss Major, know. Major Miss Sydney Jacks. Everybody. Yeah. You earn, I'm you know? just. <laughs> am Sydney. <laughs> yeah. It's just Am Sydney. <laughs> Like if you talk to a doctor and you don't call him doctor, they get all pissed off. It's like you know, I paid how much money for that? Come on, I don't know, man. That sounds a little, little extra. You know, like when I became a drill sergeant, you know, like correcting people. It's like it's drill sergeant. Matter of fact, a, a new candidate just recently asked. He was like, he's like, call me back. He's like, hey, real quick, do I do I need to call you drill sergeant or sergeant? I'm like, bro, like I don't it's drill sergeant at work for sure. Okay, that's fine, but like otherwise whatever man <laughs> i don't care i'm retiring <laughs> not to say that you don't care but i mean if you're a trainee in basic training yeah call him drill sergeant man like that's how that rolls but like in real life whatever anyway uh sydney jacks everybody hey <laughs> welcome back we're glad to have you again um, happy to be back yeah for sure what is going on in your world Tell us, tell us everything A to Z, and we're not going to say anything at all. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So, what what month did we do our first one? Oh, geez, pop quiz, everybody. Uh, Minus. well, Minus. it was this year, right? Oh, it was women's. It was like March, right? Oh, it yeah. was for Women's History yeah. Month. That was the other day. All yeah. right. So, not even that long. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's been. It's like three months ago. It's like. Um, right, April, May, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I've just been, I've been, I've been traveling quite a bit, honestly. Um, switching, switching jobs up to uh, the plan snops position for IPSE, so I'm transitioning into that right now, so that's cool. Uh, went on leave to Portugal for almost two weeks, that was awesome. Um, went to LA for Easter. I missed it, man. I, <laughs> yeah. I, hey, Nintendo sorry. World. <laughs> like, Nintendo World was awesome. Mm. Have you been there yet? No, I haven't. I think like the day after you went, my wife and then my son went. I, I still haven't yeah. been, but it looks pretty awesome. You got to go. Uh, what that was is awesome. Nintendo that was my first World? time in LA. Nintendo what? World. Okay, so that's at Universal Studios Hollywood. Right mm -hmm. next door to it, or built into it, there's a Nintendo World, which is looks like Super Mario Brothers in real life. Looks like you took a bunch of mushrooms yeah. and walked into a video game. Yeah, you like you feel like you're in the game. Yeah, it it's it's wild. Is it only at the one in California? Mm -hmm. Fuck, man! You gotta come to come to. This is where everything is, man. Not everything. Mm -hmm. Mount I mean, Rushmore's not there. We have pictures of it. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> probably buy one of those little statues of it yeah, probably true yeah how was portugal i um i've never um in my life honest to god like i i've you know we've tyree and i've been all over the place i'm sure you've been all over the place but like i've never in my life have been like portugal i'm gonna go to portugal i want to move there honestly i want to live yeah. there or at least like be able to spend a significant amount of time within the year or within a year there um i mean i I appreciate Europe in general a lot. Uh, I always feel healthy when I'm there. Like I, I spent the whole month of January into February there. Um, and I just, right away, I just feel healthier from the food. I feel healthier from the water, from the way that just their lifestyle of living, of health and, and everything. And like, yeah, I know that doesn't, it's, oh, you know, American, you know, capitalism and work hard and all this stuff. Like, yes, I appreciate that, but I also, I just feel so healthy there and Portugal, I think um, you don't have a lot of like the uppity European stuff. Uh, it's way more laid back. It's super surfy, surf vibes. Um, my boyfriend and I were there to really to surf. Um, I would have never guessed like surf vibes there. Oh yeah. I mean, that I, that's where like Nazare is there. That's where like the biggest, yeah, <laughs> the biggest wave say. is and, <laughs> I mean, and I don't so, know anything about surfing, but you know, yeah, as, is, isn't it, like the world life. record um, mm -hmm. biggest wave out there? Like, really? Yeah. 
Wasn't that recently? Like some dude just caught that like recently. Yeah, some German dude. Yeah. Yeah. I um, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure they're surfing in Africa. Yeah, I know. I know some surfing <laughs> brothers. It's all good. I wonder if you can surf in like, like we were talking about Iceland earlier. I wonder if you can surf there. Would you want to? It was cold. Think, yeah. Uh, probably. I mean, there's people that <laughs> surf. There's people that's like mm. uh, Arctic surf, like. Up. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're seen... they're in like the dry suit. Yeah. No, I've seen pictures of those, like and they got like ice all over their face. Um, was that really messed up of me? What I just said, Tyree. Uh, what? <clears throat> about how like there's surfing and like there's a whole coast in africa was that wrong of me to say that no okay I'm sure there's people that surf in africa there's nothing wrong with that all right I just if, I, if you were like if, if you had said some wild shit i would i'd call you out so don't worry okay immediately be... call you out. okay <laughs> all right good You're all um right. <clears throat> all right but yeah there's like there's and i mean in the movie um surfs up like penguins like surfing and stuff so I thought I, I totally thought you were about to say Surf Ninjas. It's one of my favorite movies no. from the nineties. Have you ever seen that? No. It's absolutely horrible. It's a terrible movie, but it's about two brothers who like are bestowed like these like powers. And one of them is like become he becomes just a ninja. Did you ever see the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two? No, that's uh, like an older brothers thing. I uh, I don't I, I I don't know why I never got into it. Well, anyway, the, the pizza delivery guy <laughs> and um he he he's in he's in it. He's the one of the he's the big brother and then the younger brother gets powers of like uh like foresight right and, but through like the uh tyree what was that sega handheld game genesis uh sega oh fuck i only I played know. sonic on sega the sega fuck i forget the name of it i can't remember either but like he, that's what he would use he would look at that thing and he could see what was about to happen and then it, it was a whole thing but kelly who's in it i don't know it's uh it's one of my favorite movies from the nineties. It's horrible. I own it on DVD. Um, I'm actually gonna watch it later on. Anyway, nice surfing Back to Portugal. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where did you stay? Like, uh, like so, I, the, we saw the pictures on Instagram, and I'm like, man, that looks really cool. That big long ass stairway you went up. Exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow, Portugal. Yeah. Okay, so we I I flew into Lisbon lesson learned from our trip to bali because he, he's deployed right now so like um giving him that four days <laughs> to himself before i showed up just made things a lot better uh so i met him in lisbon he picked me up and then we drove up to um Peniche, which is kind of halfway to porto it's like right in the top half of portugal um big surf spot uh just super fish like fishing town surf spot absolutely amazing uh landscape and geography so we stayed there for about four days four or five days um surfed every day and then drove down the coast and went to Aracera for a few days which was so beautiful as well um a little bit more You could just tell it's a little bit more developed, um, a little bit more touristy, a lot more touristy, because I think it's within that Lisbon district. And uh, and then we were there for a few days, surfed there. So most of the surfing there, the waves were like too intense for me. I like I broke a couple of fins like my first time trying to go out. And then um, and then we went to Lisbon for three days before I flew home. That's fucking awesome. Sounds like a nice experience. Yeah, if you beautiful. haven't traveled, travel, man. Yeah. Did you uh did you do you know any Portuguese or is it like do no. they speak a lot of English over there? Yeah, it's a lot of English. And I want to get better at that. Like I want to get better at really studying the language before. I I I usually do. Um but yeah, I, I didn't really I didn't fully commit to this one. <laughs> Yeah. With the language at least. What do you but I, I try to what do you use to I mean, and this is I don't know if we're on the market or not, but like what do you use to like learn a language? There's like different apps and stuff. No, no, but like what do you what do you typically go to? Oh, I I don't know the name of it. Oh, so I, I think so... I, I usually like I'll download it and then delete it after I'm done, like once I do the trip, but 
Yeah. Whatever free one. <laughs> oh, okay. I was going to say, so yeah. I've been using this one called Pimsleur. And yeah. this is like an unofficial plug for them, I guess. Um, so yeah, I've used I, I've used Babel. I've used the one with the bird. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I've used Rosetta. And mm-hmm. um, and I took two and a half years of Spanish in high school. And I'll tell you, like, Pim, so the way Pimsleur does it is that, like, you listen to two people, two native people speaking, right? They have a conversation. And then it breaks down that conversation down to, like, the syllable of some words, depending on how big the word is. And they teach you how to say it. And then they explains how the, the conversation progresses, why it, you know, they're using certain words. And you think about like when you were a kid and you learned English, like you weren't learning like verbs and conjugation and you know, all that stuff. Like you were just mm-hmm. listening to people speak like, oh, that's how, that's what those words mean. And in that combination, that's what that sentence means and so on. And yeah. um, so that's how it teaches it. But it's like 20 bucks a month, I think. But you get access to like 51 languages. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like it's that's it cool. Is, yeah. And it, it almost, I think it guarantees like conversational understanding of the language um, in 30 days. Nice. Yeah. So I also, so I also just try to learn from t- talking to people, honestly. Like I'm just trying to do a lot better at like actually just having conversations with people. And especially when traveling, um, we're so easy to just let our insecurities keep us from trying to have a conversation or just asking questions about somebody or asking them, you know, how do you say this? How do you say this? How do you say this? So like a waiter or a waitress or somebody. And every single time, like four, four out of five times, the conversation ends with like either laughter or smiling with that person that local person teaching you like one or two words. Um, Or if I'm like struggling to remember what the word is and I say it and that person like helps me and laughs, like it's just friendly um, and it just helps the vibe. (laughs) So I did a lot of that. I did a lot of that in Portugal too. No, that's um, when we were in Germany. So before we went, before I went to Germany, I I was learning German um, on my Mm -hmm. own. I was a big fan of the band Rammstein. Um, mm-hmm. and so I was trying to like learn the language so I can understand the lyrics. And so when I got out there, I, I, I knew a fair bit, a fair amount. Um, we had to take a week of like German head start where they teach you like how to count and how to ask for things and where are things and whatever. And, uh, but the six months that I was that first six months I was in Germany before Tyree and I went to Kosovo, like I picked up German so well, like the last weekend out, um, I was a little inebriated. But my German friends all said that I spoke really, really good German when I was drunk. Nice. Were you, know you dreaming I mean? in German? Uh, no. So I don't really dream. Mm. You know oh. what I mean? Like I don't remember them anymore. <laughs> but I've always, I've always looked out for that, right? So like, if I do have yeah. a dream and like I'm speaking another language or understanding another language, because that's supposed to be like the, you know, like the if you're dreaming another language, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was, it was being around the Germans and like being able to. You're exactly right. I, in Head Start, I remember they were teaching us how to say I want in German, you know, and it's ich, ich, ich möchte, möchte. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 got, it's a weird thing in the back of the throat with an R in there too, but it's a soft R. I don't know. It's a weird thing, but like, I couldn't figure it out in class. And so like we were at a bar one night and I was asking the bartender, like, hey man, how do I say I want a beer? And he's like, I'm like, no, 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 no. But like, how do I say I want it? And he's like, oh, okay. And he told me and like a little back and forth for like 30 seconds. And I was like, and I had it. You know, and he's like, ah, oh, yeah, Ganel, very good, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, like, you're, you're absolutely right, like, you, you bet you learn the language, like, when you're immersed in it, and you're surrounded by it. it, yeah, I loved it, I love learning languages, but, you know, it's harder when you're sitting at home trying to learn it, you know. Yeah, because there's a whole, art, there's a whole cultural art to every language, like, the evolution of a language it is the evolution of a culture, so just experiencing that culture, especially if you're drunk learning German, like, there you go. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll flow better. <laughs> it, it grew with the, with the drinking, I'm sure. Well, and that's the, that's the thing like I heard. So like, if you learn another language prior to puberty, then you're, and you learn it from a natural speaker, then you're, mm-hmm. you're likely to learn that language as a natural speaker. Cause once you hit puberty, all the bones and everything in your face kind of settle into the position and it becomes more difficult to speak the way they do. And like Tyree and I had two friends over there, uh, uh, uh caroline and caroline and stephanie remember them 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the creation, two, my creation. When they, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two, they, they were two Americans. Like, so their 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 dad was American, their mom is German. So they grew up speaking both languages, and they could switch back and forth. Um, and it sounded completely natural, but they learned both languages early on. Um, so I think whenever you drink, though, or whenever the muscles in your face are relaxed, it helps with pronunciation mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. So that's just my theory, anyway. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears because I'm <laughs> have to switch gears all the time. You were in a relationship. You were married during your deployment, and we kind of brushed on this a little bit in the last show. I have no experience mm -hmm. on what it's like to be married while deployed. Uh, no, Kevin doesn't. Tell us what it's like to be married and deployed, and a female doing all this stuff because it's just that much more worse because you know what happens or with the female deployments mm -hmm. we really don't i mean not female deployments but, you know females on deployment so there's multiple deployments too so i so looking back <laughs> looking back i can see the progression of me uh just I, just growing and changing and I think fighting fighting the growth within myself and a causing conflict within myself. So I know that's a kind of an interesting way to start the answer. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, especially so the the first deployments, I mean, they weren't combat deployment. It wasn't a combat deployment. So it wasn't that difficult. Um, it wasn't that difficult for him either because he was he was in grad school. Um, but then when I came back and then I started actually having like combat deployments in all male units. Uh, so I was in, so that was going to be, that was Iraq 2016, 2017 with ISIS up in Mosul with um, Airborne Infantry Battalion in the 82nd. And that was the first time I was experiencing like fear <laughs> and stress and adrenaline on a deployment. And being around all men that were my best friends, that were my brothers, and you develop a love in that situation and you develop very close relationships and you just, it's not necessarily a physical love, it's, you, you bond. And I was growing, I was changing, like, that's what happens in combat, like you, <laughs> you experience that type of stuff and you're going to change and you should, you should experience those things and change. Um, and then, and my ex-husband had not served, he wasn't military. And at the time, like, I, I very much valued that in our relationship because I was always around men at work and I liked having, I liked being able to be around a man who wasn't in the military. And, um, I changed, like, I just started seeing things differently. I, I started seeing him differently. Um, I also, I mean, at that time, like he had just gotten out of school. So I was the, I was the breadwinner. Um, I was making decisions because I had lived on my own before. And I know this sounds like I'm emasculating him and, and I don't mean to, that's just what the situation was. Like he's, he's on his own, he's independent, he's remarried and like doing his thing now. But at that time, like I just started, I was just growing and I, I was, you know, evolving and adulting really hard. Um, and then I just kept deploying and I kept changing and I kept growing and becoming harder and harder and probably becoming a little bit more masculine and more masculine. And then ranger school, <laughs> I mean, like that type of shit <laughs> that I went through there, I'm, I'm like laughing about it right now, but that's really just a coping mechanism. But um I became to not, I like, I got to the point where I couldn't re really relate to him anymore and I couldn't relate to our relationship anymore. And uh, the love that I was feeling for other people, um, just from, from such close friendships with other men that understood me better than he ever could. And um, I, and I don't say that that's what happens to every every relationship, that dynamic that was like me and him. But I didn't know I didn't know what to do with that. Like I didn't even see it really happening. Um, I wasn't really talking to other people about it. I wasn't asking other women who had been in that tip of, like who was I going to talk to? 
Um, and it just really drifted apart, honestly. Like I drifted. He was he was great. I I drifted away. Um, and now my relationship now. Um, he he's prior service. Um, and we have that connection. Like we just, it's just a lot easier to be able to relate for him to kind of, to understand and be able to empathize and see what I've done and how that has an effect on me. And he also, he also is a guy that I appreciate like keeping me in line. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, there needs to, like with respect like it's not that i did it's not that i don't respect my ex-husband um but i knew that like i when i was in it like when i was in those infantry units like i was you couldn't tell me anything like i was on my game i was running it i was calling i was making decisions i was calling the shots but with my current relationship i appreciate um getting to be a woman in my definition of woman of what i think a woman should be um and my femininity and I can express that <laughs> and I can, I can nurture that and dial back on the masculinity. Um, I don't know if that's because he's prior service. I, I'm not sure, but there's definitely an understanding of deployments and combat and all of that. Um, and it's also really weird because he's forward right now and he has been for the past couple of years and I'm back here in DC and um there's definitely a an appreciation that I never had for my ex-husband that I now do have being on this side of it. Mm. It's not easy. It's, uh, I don't think either one is harder. They're both very, very difficult for completely different reasons. I would prefer to be deployed. <laughs> It's really all I'm going to say. I, I would prefer to be deployed than be here uh, with with my partner um, deployed. How There's, old were sure. you when uh, you got married? Do you think that could have been good things? No, um, we were together for a really long time before we got married. We were together for like five and a half, six years before we got married. And we got married... Uh, we had a we had a marriage plans like a wedding plans and everything but then um and but then our deployment to iraq it isis was isis was fucking stuff up honestly like it wasn't we just started getting more details about what the deployment was going to be like and my father had a stroke and um so we just did a courthouse wedding over Thanksgiving up near where, like right where both of our families were so that everybody could be there. And um, in case something happened to me, I didn't want my family to have to, like, I just wanted it to be one person that I trusted everything. Like, you know, we had been together for six years at that point. Like, um, but I think I, you know, I don't, I don't think age really is a thing. I think it's maybe life experience. I hadn't experienced what I was meant to yet. Um, I hadn't done what I was meant to do yet. Life had been kind of easy up yeah. till that point. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot to say. There's a, there's a lot to say about like, you know, so you, you, know, you, you do a certain role in the military and you have to deploy, do these things and the maturity that you're forced to go through. Um, <clears throat> you're right. I mean, it does, it does create this whole other, uh, life experience that you're not going to get outside of the military and i mean i've seen it before with friends of mine who were married and are now divorced and you know that usually happens shortly after a deployment or two and mm -hmm. it's because they do grow apart right because you mm -hmm. do go on these deployments you do experience life in a completely different way and you 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 gain this completely different perspective meanwhile nothing really changes back home for their significant other um and it just doesn't have to be even it doesn't really honestly have to be a deployment overseas. Like yeah, uh, I'm in doesn't. the reserves and I don't deploy overseas. I mobilize stateside to do drill sergeant duties. And I've gone on mobs, uh, for, you know, year long mobs um, in the States. And I've seen marriages fall apart because of that um, from my buddies that I was mobilized with, because again, they're up there doing a thing. They have this, this mission, this goal. I have to serve my time and I have to train to do this thing and I have to be successful at it. And that's where my focus is. And, 
you know, your family is so, as much as it's kind of shitty to say, it's like out of sight, out of mind almost. And they kind yeah. of take a seat in the back burner and then the, the relationship suffers. Um, and in a lot of those cases, you know, um, it's my opinion that, you know, the, the, the significant other that's out of the picture, so to speak, um, is allowing the stresses of them being apart to kind of get to them and yeah. applies more stress to the person who is mobilized. It's, it's a whole thing. It's an interesting dynamic, but at the same so, time, go ahead. No, it's really interesting you say that because with my boyfriend being where he is and I uh, like trying to figure out the right way to support him because I would keep putting myself in my own position when I was deployed and what I wanted, which I didn't even know at the time. I didn't even know what I wanted. Honestly, I didn't know what kind of support I wanted. I wasn't, I, I, I just, okay. So to get to the point, um, you're good. You're breaking it down. Yeah. No like, I, I first started out by trying, like, I try, I would try to give him as much attention as I could, like as much support and love and attention and everything as I possibly could. And I was like, for, cause we've, we've done this relationship now for, um, a few, like almost a few years now with him being over there and like, we'll see each other. He'll come back and all this stuff. And, um, What I found was like, <clears throat> my issue is that I will build my resentment up because I'm not necessarily getting back what I need, but I keep forgetting. I keep putting myself back into that position of where like, he can't do that. Like he can't emotionally give me what I need right now um, because he's there. And I have to keep reminding myself, like Sydney, when you were deployed, you were the same way. You were completely focused on the job. You were focused on, like you can't, it's so difficult for you to even open your brain up beyond the, the, the perimeter, like beyond the T-wall, it's very difficult to allow your brain to go beyond that because you have to compartmentalize and you have to stay focused and not be emotional because it's hard enough. So like you just cut your emotions off and I have to keep reminding myself, like that's where he's at. Like that's where his mental space is. And I know he's trying, like, I know he's doing what he can to give me what I need, but like, I've got to give myself that and I've got to be independent with that emotionally and, and everything. It's really hard. Like it's very difficult, especially when I'm in this reality, like I'm in reality here um, versus you, the second you deploy me, if I were to deploy next week, the second I touch that ground or honestly, probably the second I go up in the air on that bird, I, my emotions are probably cut off. Like I, I'm back into the game. I'm, I'm back into, you know, stepping on the court we're warming up to play this game and I'm in my, my, I'm in the game, but you can't, it's so hard to do that stateside or not deployed. And, um, I, I have found this, this whole, this whole newfound appreciation for what my ex had to go through and not even understanding it, like not even, not even having the privilege of, of deploying before to try to understand it. Are there any support groups or anything like that for folks who are deployed right now? Like your, your spouse's spouse support groups, anything like that? Um, what do you mean? Do we even like, you know, like sometimes they're family re readiness groups for, uh, he's not like groups. that. No, he's not. No. All right. Well, you know, some, some units have that maybe that yeah. was like a back in the day thing. Yeah. I don't know if they do that. Um, I think he's the like closest a really, thing would, he's like a real loner <laughs> in a really that, good way. <laughs> I would, I would think like the closest thing would be like an FRG or something for people that are back yeah. in the rear or whatever. But you know, there's something to be yeah. said about that though. Like some of the best friends, you know, that the old old saying goes, right? Some of the best friends you make are in the military, right? Because yeah. we go through some shit together, right? Even yeah. if you never deploy, and the worst thing you ever do in the military is basic training or boot camp, depending on which branch you go into. Like, if that's the worst thing you ever experience. The closest that you develop uh, um, with the, the people that you're there with, like, that's a bond. It is. You embrace the suck. And there's, you know, I'm sure there's psychology behind it. Like, you know, like this, this, the, this tightness that is formed in those situations. And I have found that, like, um, y y dating civilians is hard. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. It is. It is. It's very difficult because, like, a, a military person understands a military person's mindset. 
Yeah. Um, especially if they've deployed, especially if yeah. they've been pulled away from their life and sent 9,000 miles away to exist somewhere completely like unrelated to the world back home for yeah. a year or however long. And, you know, it's, it, it makes that relationship relatable, even if you didn't yeah. go with, with that person, you know? Yeah. It's just, a, it's just an understanding. Yeah. And like, I, honestly, it's like, you understand the language, you understand what you need to hear. Um, you understand like when you need space and I have to keep reminding myself that it's like when he's not, when he just needs space to give him the space, but like when he needs the right support because sh shit gets hard, like I know what to say. And I, I think that's how, when I knew that my marriage was over. Uh, I was in Afghanistan and, um, you know, it was, it was really tense. It was really tense over there for a few days after um, we took out <laughs> that Iranian general. Um, just waiting to see what the reality retaliation tactics were going to be. And it was really, really tense there. And I think that was the most, um, one of the top three <laughs> most stressful three days of my life. Um, I... And it wasn't just me. It was like you you could feel like it was just this it was this energy. You could just feel this energy of just what's going to happen it was this limbo phase. And. Um, and I sent some texts to my ex-husband that was like, look, like. I mean, I don't even know what I can how much I can share about that, um, about like what was happening at that time. But I, I, I sent text messages to him that was like. I'm like, I very well might not come home. Like this is, and it's not like I'm going out on a mission. It's like every, every minute that goes by, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and he just didn't know what to say. Like he, he didn't know. And what he did say, I, I think I like threw my phone across the room and was like, fuck this. Like it, it just, I, I realized like there's no, there's no coming back. Like I am such a different, like I am. And then um, my, my boyfriend now kind of went through a similar, like, uh, you know, and it's like, I know what to say. Like, I know, I know what you need to hear. And we have that understanding and that connection. So yeah, it's just, it's just different. I mean, there's, there's complexity in every relationship, but at least the common understanding is just knowing knowing what you need to say and knowing what you need to hear um, in those in those types of unique situations. Like I'm very grateful that we can we can do that. Um, yeah. But. So in in either role, right? So in both roles, let's say mm -hmm. um, you're the one deployed versus they're the one deployed. What is what is like the the like the single one like best advice that you would give to somebody in either role? Honestly, this is going to sound crazy, but like the importance of friends outside of your relationship, who you surround yourself with while they're gone. And I don't think that gets talked about enough. Like there's enough, there's enough things like communication and trust in this and that, like that shit is important. <laughs> it, like it's going to be hard no matter what, but I think the, the one thing that I think is a unique answer that I haven't heard before is the friendships that the people and the friends that you put your energy into, because you can't, at least for, for my sake, as a woman, like, and I've talked to a couple of other, other, uh, of my friends who have been in these situations before. And it's like, we go fucking crazy. Like, at least I go crazy when I'm like, and when I don't hear from him, cause I'm like, did something happen or is he upset or is something going on blah, blah, blah. And, and I'll turn to him to try to solve it rather than just no, I got to call my girlfriend. Like I got to go, I got, I got to go do my hobby. I got to go do something fun with my friends. I've got to call my family. I've got to keep those relationships and those friendships that are around me really strong so that I can turn to them and I can vent to them. And I don't, I'm not venting to him because he's got enough shit going on. I've got enough shit going on when I'm deployed. I don't want to hear all of this negative stuff. Mm. Like if I can build those friendships or, my, you know, have a therapist or build those friendships with people that are here and when I really need to vent or when I'm having an issue and I can, I can get some advice too, like before, before and do the prep work there before I try to have this more difficult conversation or heavy conversation with my person, 
um, so I can I can smooth it out and I can get the right phrases right and I can try to keep my emotions in check um, to keep it calm because when you're forward the second adrenaline or issues from home start coming up you just shut it off like you 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 can just disconnect you're already disconnected so like the minute issues are coming up from home at least for me it's like I can well I'm not there yeah. um that's mildly interesting when that's the a cop term when something is so insignificant yeah. have something so massive going on here Mm -hmm. Tell me about the burnt mashed potatoes that you guys had last night. Yeah, like <laughs> who shits about that? Yeah, you know, I, I don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's something to be said about that too, right? So <clears throat> even after deployments and all of that stuff, and you're back home and you're living your normal life, whether you're in the army or not, or military or not, those small things are still trivial, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we've literally experienced possibly fucking dying. You know, and being mm -hmm. completely aware of it. It's it's not it's not like you're you know, you're driving on the road and, and maybe a car comes into your lane and sideswipes you and you fucking flip over and blow up and all that stuff. It's you are in a place where people are actively trying to kill you. You accept and yeah, right. And so like when you come back from that, like these big problems that you know, these things that were big problems before are now just trivial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you look at the other person complaining about those problems, and you're like, man, yeah, you know what the fuck I just been through when you complain about this? Well, maybe I should, yeah, this whole shit. Like, Dude, yeah. it it was a whole thing, man. And I, and I honestly, God, like, when we got back in 05 and I left the army, you know, like that period that I was in the IRR for a year, like, I mean, even in years after coming in back in the reserves, whatever, when I would listen to people complain about things, like, I can't believe this, I can't believe that. And it's just these small things, in insignificant things. And I totally get it. Like in from their perspective, they're they're big or they mean something, but like in the grand scheme, it's like, but you're not gonna fucking die from it. Like one of your friends is not gonna get blown up from it. Like it's fine, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I and, and, and a lot of times I found myself kind of vocalizing that and I felt in you know, afterwards, like I felt kind of like an asshole, but what was the reaction you got from whoever you went off on with saying hey that ain't shit because i know i got like yeah it ain't shit to you but it's shit to me yeah you know, it's all but relative. i think you know it is it is important though to come back and like adjust mm -hmm. out of that deployed mentality though like it's 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 important it's it's way harder than deploying yeah, it is the transition is insanely difficult coming back is way way yeah way harder than going because you do have to do that you do have to remind yourself that these these um these trivial things once upon a time to you might have been a little more significant had a little bit more impact on your day-to-day -day life and 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 i think honestly honestly like you know when you're on social media and you see these people that were like back in my day when i was in 15 years ago etc um, I think a lot of those people are kind of losing, losing, losing track of that. Right. Like, because mm -hmm. they'll, or they never, they never were on track with that. Like they did their three, four years in six years in, they left the army, never went back. And they're still living in that mentality that like, what I went through was harder than anything you'll ever go through, regardless of perspective. Um, and, and yeah, sure. You went through some tough times. But just because somebody didn't deploy to combat doesn't mean that what they're going through isn't tough, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it yeah. is, you're right. That's, that's the, that is the, one of the hardest parts of, of the transition. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, man. Like, I don't think we fully process and, and people who deployed like the, the, like the rough, the mid two thousands, early two thousands, like, I don't know what that's like. And, and I'm, I'm grateful I don't know what that's like because it's when I talk to people who have been there in like 08 and, and 2003 and stuff like it's it's horrific. It's a different um, time. It was a different Yeah, time. so and and the you know the top 3 things of trauma trauma's trauma, you know, and and it's a different type of trauma that's now even more unique and more specified in a smaller group that understands it and and I'm not saying, you know, what am I trying to say? Deploying now, like people who are deploying now for support, like in Poland or wherever, 
just because they're not experiencing um, a lot of death around them and a lot of atrocities around them, I think that just exposes the difficulties with relationships or the difficulties with emotions, especially because you have the you have the expectation of having a phone and having service too. Like you have the expectation that you should be FaceTiming your family while they're having Christmas dinner and the expectation that you should be making time for phone calls every day, which is a great thing, but it's just another added pressure versus like when I, when I'm deployed and I can't have my phone on me because I'm in a secure location, it makes it a lot easier to be honest with you. Like, and it makes it a lot easier to just stay focused and be like, oh, well, I can't be there or I can't be on my phone. So like, there's, there's different things that like, um, and I'm not saying that people deploying now to Poland have it as hard as people and not, that's not what I'm saying at all, but it's, you can't, you can't compare the two. There's, there's definitely difficulties. Them. There's definitely difficulties on both sides. Um, yeah. I could, I couldn't imagine if, so Tyree and I deployed in 04 and back when you're talking about, and it was, it was, it was bad news bears over there. Um, uh, it was called the wild west for a reason. Uh, and I could not imagine if we had, if we had cell phones that we have now, like we had, we had a, a phone place where you had to go buy phone cards to call back home. And, and when something bad would happen, they'd black out, you know, communication. So you couldn't call back yeah. until next of kin was reached. And uh, so, yeah, and I could, I could not imagine if we had access to our cell phones 24 or seven, because especially with how people, you know, nowadays, and I'm guilty of it, like, yeah. you know, like how, how we have our cell phones, like it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's and and that's not to say uh, that people like you like 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 a a, uh, a rotation to Poland, uh, for example. That's not to yeah. say that something like that doesn't have its hardships. Um, oh yeah. Because you're still away, right? You're still not, and there is the expectation that you're going to be able to reach out back home and all that stuff. But I mean, as we all know in the military, despite what the military says, mission first. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Perfect example of people who are not necessarily deployed, but they're in a hot spot. Anyone dealing with anything nuclear right now, you're waiting for, yeah. you know, hot button shit to go on. That's yeah. stressful as fuck. Yeah, I'm not taking bullets, but man, at any second, this phone could go off. And that's really starting to affect my family because, you know, not all these people who work there are a bunch of old people. They're a bunch of young, new guys there, too. And yeah. Feeling that also. So I, I understand that totally. Like, or it's. it's um sorry i was gonna say even um and i thought you were about to say this like being mobilized to the border right here you are stateside Dude. you're still in the country but like mission first right you're like you're you're away you're you're doing this this mission and you are seeing hardship you're seeing yeah these people who who yeah. want a better life um and, and i don't think we know the worst of it to be honest with you i don't i don't think we know the worst of what this the what you know the soldiers down there Yeah, no, I agree. Like it's, we're not, and you know, and you know, they can't be posting about it. Right. But like, no. they might be calling back home and they're limiting information, just like how, you know, Tyree and I did when we were deployed. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's, that's a whole different ball game here. You are in Texas yeah. or New Mexico or Arizona, or even like Southern California, maybe, I don't know where all they're deployed to. I think mostly just in Texas. Right. But you, you, you know, like I'm in the United States. And I'm I mean, dude, this. dude, like, especially, especially if you, your ethnicity is that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like, especially so, if you're so, you know, if, if yeah. you speak, the, if you speak Spanish or you, and you have family that, you know, you may be first or second generation, you know, like. I. Mm. I know the feeling, man. Like as a as a cop dealing with some criminals as a black man, automatically you're like, look at this fucking Uncle Tom doing this shit. I could see that maybe happening on the border. Like, why aren't you helping your people? Why are you trying to lock them up? Then you got the social media out here. As soon as that shit happens, everyone knows about it. You don't even have time to defend yourself. It's just mm -hmm. out there. It's fucking rough, man. On on I mean, it's, it's it Oh, go ahead, Sid. No, like you, you know, you know they're utilizing the people that speak Spanish yeah. to be there, right, th right, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's uh, and so that's another <laughs> thing too. Is uh, <laughs> uh, I took the blur off. Um, yeah. That's yeah, another thing. Know, sorry, I'm gonna put it back on. 
No, you're good. Um, that's another thing too, right? Okay, so like on on the one hand, right from from their perspective, seeing this soldier in uniform who, like you said, maybe first generation, second generation, um, or even a naturalized citizen through that process. Like I know people in the military who um, I, I worked with a guy when I was in California who his upbringing he was like a coyote for the cartel, mm-hmm. right? And he understood in his later teen years the dangers of being in that position and got as far the fuck away from as he could, ended up joining the military, way better life. But the dude, you know, he he saw both sides of it and he definitely like preferred, you know, the side that he's on now. And then I have a friend of mine who, um, well, she was actually born in Texas and then smuggled into Mexico and grew up there. <laughs> but she's also in the military. Damn. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but she's also in the military. She's in the U.S. military and um, in Texas, actually. And and so you can you can there's that side of it, too. So like the people, the people who are who are in the, in the struggle, right, looking at this person in uniform being like, how can you do this to your own people? And then the, the flip side of that, having to be in that uniform and having mm-hmm. to do that, like understanding where they came from, understanding why they are there and if you speak the language then you have access to what is actually being said mm. you know what's you know what's kind of crazy uh what we're talking about right now like storyline wise i had a conversation this past week with um one of the girls that i met through my page she's a, a amazing agnco up here in the dc area phenomenal career just absolutely phenomenal career and we we were having this conversation about like um specifically like women who have gone through ranger school or women who are in uh like use of sock so calm that um are still within their bubble like still within their bubble of perfection or bubble of like focus and everything is okay and the, those of us who have had our bubble popped and we now are looking at it from a different lens. Like we had our reality check of something of just taking a step back and seeing like, wow, there's a, there's a lot of shit involved in this. And what am I doing to try to make this better? Um, from the female perspective, like the women's stuff and the women who are, have a platform or have this experience and have this, you know, have the certain badges and tabs on their uniform and work in certain units and have a certain rank. And these women that have positions of like, yo, like stop selling out, (laughs) like start speaking the truth, like start actually recognizing some of the stuff that's happening to you. And like, it doesn't mean everything is bad, but like the, the top few things that are just always fucked up, like, and you're denying it, like, start speaking up and it's it's kind of similar to it's it's a little bit similar to what we're talking about where you're in this position of um maybe it's almost like the younger women you know trying to trying to get into it like from the migrants trying to get into america and they're looking at their own people on the other side like help us and or like help like kind of create some sort of a situation that makes this a little bit more efficient (laughs) and a little bit better like we're not here to try to break all these laws and stuff but like try to make a situation that makes it work a little bit better and nothing you know not being able to maybe like not being able to say anything or not being able to create any change because you're you're just there in your uniform doing your job but like where's the line between just doing your job and then and then um having that intestinal fortitude to do a little bit more and trying to find a way to do more than what's expected of you. I don't know if any of that made sense at all. Uh, you can cut that out if you need to, but. <laughs> no, I, I, so the way I, um, in my mind, what I, what I connected it to was, what was it last year, year before last, that Marine, uh, was he a Lieutenant Colonel, you know, standing up for injustices Yo, yeah. or all that stuff. And then his career mm-hmm. gets fried and you know, sent on his way. Right. So what I, what I imagine for these people on the border in uniform, you know, regardless of, of rank. Um, but let's say you got this young E5 who is a firstborn, his parents, you know, migrated here, came here illegally or not. 
And now he's on the border and he's heard the stories from when, you know, mom and dad came across and, and had to deal with all that stuff. And he understands from a secondhand point of view, what these yeah. people are going through. And he speaks the language and he understands the slang and he knows what's going on, but he can't do anything more than what his yeah. rank says and what his unit says, yep. what the United States army says and the DOD says. Yep. And if he does do more than that, he's fucked. Yeah, well, there's a difference between an E5 and like an E8 or like an O4. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, you know, and but and like you're you're still kind of bound to that 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 oath of you know of enlistment or you know office or you know commission or whatever. Like you're still kind of bound to like UCMJ. Yeah, but I think mm-hmm. if you get enough people behind you for whatever fucking issue, if you can all get on the same page and push it as a group, raging mm-hmm. machine, man. Yeah. It's, I mean, I hear that though. And like, I, I understand, I understand that you, you have taken an oath, but what have you taken an oath to? You've taken it to an idea. You've taken it to a philosophy. And yes, you know, you, you subject yourself to punishment or ridicule when you step up and try to make a change or bring light to an issue. And again, we're talking about, we're talking about apples and oranges. Like I'm not necessarily talking about the border right now. Like I'm talking about other, you know, other things of more of what I spend my, my time and on. And I know more of like, (laughs) I haven't been down to the border to work down there. So I don't want to assume too much, but like there's, yeah, there's, there's risk involved in speaking up and stepping out and maybe even saying like this, this part of UCMJ, this, this code or this law (laughs) is is outdated like needs to be we changed. need to relook this yeah right. like yeah. you need mm-hmm. evolution if and you it's, don't it's, if you're not changing <laughs> like you're you're dust if you're not changing and growing yeah it's not gonna ch- and you're right it's not going to change unless yeah. somebody says hey uh this is old as fuck can we yeah. do something can we do something about it and you know and and to clarify you know like yeah like the, so the whole border thing like hypothetical situations that that we're talking about whereas what you're talking about is actual reality of things yeah um it's like especially if you if you've got access to the decision makers right like Mm. yeah have a conversation (laughs) yeah maybe love elbows great i think maybe i mean i gotta be the guy who says on the other side like hey you're in the military things are kind of cushy for you you know this economy right now, if you lose this job, because face it, it's just a job for a lot of these people. If they lose this shit, they are fucked for real. What are they going to do? So they're going to sit there and take injustice just because they can basically keep yeah. their health insurance for their family. Yeah, That's I get that. Rough, man. People, I, I feel that hard, but uh, what are you going to do, really? Yeah, it's, they, I, yeah got to get people together to to do something at that point because you know your voice it would be it would be nice if there was like a system in place right to where you know there were maybe a committee of some type that would review certain things maybe annually to see or maybe if there was just like surveys that were sent out across the force that people actually did and then were I actually they don't do those <laughs> fucking surveys man <laughs> nobody does that shit dude like nobody does <laughs> and but that's the thing is a lot of those and i have noticed like a lot of those surveys are not really like covering the things that we need them to cover right? exactly it's yeah. not covering I a lot almost, of stuff. i almost <laughs> when i was at 75th um so when i was the rs1 i um i almost filed an eo complaint on the EO survey that they sent down for us to complete. <laughs> because, um, okay, so I'm sitting as the, the regimental S1. So anything that, any tasker that's coming down for any data or analysis on numbers and stuff like that on people, like, I think that's the irony of it too, where it's like, I'm in the, I'm in the position of like HR and recruiting and people as who I, who I was. Um, so I, I see it from a, so many different lenses and, and I get this tasker, this like four page column of data that I have to, my guys in my shop, I have to pull all of this data from all of these different HR systems, like broken down a, a column for men, a column for women and by rank of all of this, like 
promoting at certain points, you know, everything HR you could imagine, injuries, so it like all the way into medical, medical types of injuries, at what point did it affect their promotion, um, promotion points, and then it was enlisted an officer, it was just a, a shit ton of data. And um, I understood why they set this down to ask, but it was like, it, at that time, we had three women in the brigade, three or four women in the brigade. And um, I we had to have the the psychs, the medical, all of the battalion, all of the battalionist ones. Um, what other shops were involved in this? Oh, our the, the like the RSTB with RASP, RASP one, RASP two, with the hiring and all of that. All of this, all of these questions, and I almost filed an EO complaint on it because I'm like. Do you not realize, like, I understand this. First off, the questions that you're asking are not the right questions. This is not the right data for you to see any type of trends or any of the things that I'm going through right now. None of this is going to tell you my biggest issues that I'm having here. They're not. Like, none of these, none, none of this data is going to give you anything that you're, that you're, the reason you're sending this survey out to collect all this information, it's not going to tell you what you need to know. Probably because you have a bunch of men sipping whiskey in a room being like oh we gotta we gotta do this spreadsheet let's just throw a bunch of questions into this and like send it down and whatever so like you have you don't have the right people in the room and then two you you understand the resentment from all of these different shops and all of these battalions having to collect all of this data <laughs> to, to it literally it probably took about eight to ten hours of man of man work like man hours in a work to, in a work week to collect all this information. And in a unit like that, all you're gonna do is you're just pissing off the battalions. You're just pissing off the shop, having to collect data again to try to show women's stuff. All it's doing is just creating even more resentment of like, oh my God, we have to do all of this because there's three women here. Like, uh, and it was, I was so fucking pissed and I'm like, we, this is why people don't want us here because now they have to spend all of this time giving all of this data that doesn't say anything for three people that they don't even know. And it's just because we're women and now we're, we're having privilege. Now it's like, Oh, they're separated all of this data to try to give them more support. And it's like, this is the type of stuff that just makes it even harder for us down at the bottom. But I don't even remember what what brought me onto this. What were we talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you were talking about surveys and like yeah, all of yeah, this yeah. stuff that it's like you're not. They don't like the climate surveys and all of this. Like it doesn't ask the questions. They don't no. And I, you know, a, a part asked. of that be if a part of that might be, maybe there's there's not representation, um, at the at the the, the correct level because yeah you you're right maybe it, maybe it is a bunch of dudes sitting around drinking whiskey and hey let's ask them let's ask them this and let's ask them that and like well this is these are the metrics that we're tracking presently and um now i will say and it, part of what you were saying kind of reminded me back to when we recorded with uh brigadier general susie Qu uh, quillen uh who's my my cg amazing woman uh she's done a great job in my division i want to point that out there um and i have no i have no i have no reason other to say that uh, other than um i just agree with it i am retiring so there's that but anyway what i'm getting to <laughs> is um she had mentioned uh i had mentioned metrics in the conversation and she was like you know i i i, I don't she i'm paraphrasing but she more or less said that she didn't like that i had mentioned metrics because they don't want to at least from her mindset they don't want to track the concept of metrics. They don't want us to be focused on metrics. They want us to be focused on being, you know, excellent at our jobs and being able to perform these jobs and, 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 and to do what needs to be done and bring up the issues that need to be brought up. And, and so when we talk about these like surveys, you know, and, and way, 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 way up there at the higher levels and like what they're tracking, you know, and what gets like, um, sent down to like, you know, like, Hey, ask your soldiers X, Y, and Z, you know, ask them these 15 questions. These are the things that we're concerned about for whatever reason, this month, this quarter, this year, whatever. And, um, 
I don't know. I, to me, I, I do, I do kind of feel like, like you said, like they're asking the wrong questions. They really are. They're not asking what the force really needs, right? They're not asking what our concerns are. And don't be wrong. Like you got a lot of folks in the military who are like, we're not getting paid enough. And I don't like that. I have to wake up at five 30 in the morning to go run five miles for no reason, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. We can, we can sift through that and weed that shit out and get to the actual, the details of it. But the people in the military, they have to force, I'm sorry, they have to voice this stuff, right? It, 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 you know, it's it's one thing to take to social media, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, and bitch about what your team leader, squad leader, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, whoever the shit did or didn't do. It's one thing to take a screenshot of what, you know, some battalion or brigade command sergeant major uh, uh, commander said and then sent out to everybody on WhatsApp and then get screenshot and send it to U.S. Army what the fuck moments, Right. Mm-hmm. But what are you actually doing to like affect change? Like, exactly. what are you actually doing? Yeah, okay. So maybe you're an E two, E three, E four. You still have the the power to do things, right? You can mm-hmm. mention these things. You can stay in long enough to become the change that you wanted to see when you were in lower enlisted. I had a huge problem with uh, this big social media influencer from back in the day. He's he's since like fallen off, I think, um, and become less and less and less. Which I'm I'm thankful for because he was toxic, right? Cocaine okay. dude. I don't know what it was, but um, this guy, he was in the army E7 and just would go on these fucking rants on like YouTube, Facebook, wherever else you could post it and just rant about the state of the army and and bitch about how these new people coming in are weaker and how back in my day, et cetera, and so on, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Here's it's what so I would do. old, dude. It makes me yawn now, yeah. people like that. It's you're so tired. Like, yeah, well, so this guy was doing this while still in and chose to get out of the army as an E7, uh, I don't know where he was in his career, but I think he was past 15 years. And in my mind, I'm like, bro, like you, one, you have a platform, a very large platform. Two, in the army, you're an E7. You have the ability to be the voice for these people below you. You have that ability. You have this platform. You can affect that change, but you decided to get out of the army to continue your career as a fucking influencer, to continue to bitch about the shit that you're not involved in anymore. So you're removed from it completely. And then he decided to come back into, I think it was like the Texas National Guard, made a big thing about it, a big post about it. Guess what, everybody? I'm back in. Like Nobody gives a fuck, dude. You're a loser. You're an asshole. And you can go fuck yourself because you're not actually doing anything to make the changes that you continue to bitch about. You're just making yeah. money off of it. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah. So ask, though all this stuff about people making changes, okay, they do all these surveys. What are they going to do with the information that they get? Yeah. I'm not seeing any big change from that. Like besides yeah. an ass chewing because, oh, you guys just feel like your uh, morale is shitty. Well, let me help you out. Besides that kind of shit. Like what do they do with all this information that they get? Like, yeah. You, you yeah. I mean, I'm sure. Go ahead. I'm sure they, they, they do what they can with it. I mean, I, after like working up here, right. Like being assigned to the Pentagon, being in the G1 and working for IPSE of all places, like the most hated, <laughs> the most hated thing, you know, until it gets smoothed out and it starts, you know, making people happy. Um, and I'm proud of that. Like, I'm really happy and, and proud of working for IPSE because it's like the definition of change, but, um, pe- they, things, people do what they can <laughs> with the data, with the metrics. Um, If you don't have the right person that knows how to implement that data and those metrics in the right way, um, that's step number one is is developing and training and um, putting people in positions to be able to communicate the data in a way that allows decision makers to make decisions. I mean, you that's all the way down at the battalion and company level, all the way up to the three star general level. Uh, if you can't communicate what the data says, you're, nothing's going to happen. But I, I do, I do like in my heart, I see it. People, people trying to make to make progressive things from the metrics and stuff like that. And but it's just a, a matter of like if that's not communicated the right way, or if the right questions are not being asked, um, especially with this integration stuff, like. Promotions are okay. Like, <laughs> we shouldn't be focusing on promotions. You should be focusing on like 
how has your personality changed? How has your mental health, like, how has your confidence changed? How has your confidence in, de- in making decisions changed? How has your social, you know, your social interactions, are you, are you still as social as you were? Are you staying home more? Um, that type of stuff for no other reason other than to provide the support and the understanding and the perspective perspective to like keep somebody healthy and keep somebody ready for game time, like keep somebody ready for deployment. It's what we're doing all of this for. <laughs> it's why we're in the uniform is to go to war. Well, and that's um, the thing, right? So in the name of readiness, right? And we yeah, want to, like... we want to, we want to know this information because we want our units to be uh, uh, ready in a moment's notice, so to speak. Right. So, right. Um, and that's one thing that my CG even said, like, we're, we're, this is for readiness. We want you, but you're right. Are they asking those questions? Because, but, and I, I think that has, has, it has a, 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 another meaning or another, and another end result, so to speak, I guess for, you know, I'll get, I'll just say what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I got a lot of words in my brain. Um, I know I've been, I've been, I've been struggling with that this entire time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, okay. On the one hand, asking the right questions. Now higher ups can know what the climate is, what the morale is, what, mm-hmm. where their confidence is, all the things that you mentioned, their morale, their ability to perform. And on the other hand, if it, it, it forces that soldier to be introspective to say, okay, how have I changed? from mm-hmm. this point in time to this point in time. It's one thing that I, 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 I started doing a long time ago. I didn't do it this last like a long thing, but like I did it a long time ago when I was a drill and I would ask the trainees to write a letter, right? Not a letter necessarily like an essay, like why I joined the military. And, you know, this would be week one and they would detail and outline all these reasons why they joined. And so I would use that one to help motivate them along the way because I would actually read them and whenever they would start to suck, right? And be like, hey man, didn't you say that you're doing this because you want to make your mom proud? Do you think how you're being right now would make your mom proud? Probably not. Oh, you, know. God damn. you know, but That's like it awesome. helps. It helps though. It does because I'll, I'll, every single time, <laughs> not every single time, they would be like, you're fucking right, Joel Smart. And I'm like, I know I'm right. And don't cuss at me because it's rude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But like, um, and then the other side of that, at the end of basic training, I would ask them again, like, Remember what you wrote in your essays. Mm-hmm. Are your reasons still the same? Right? Did you, to, to this day, after having gone through nine weeks of basic training and learning all the things you've learned and the bonds that you formed, are your reasons still the same? Like, sure, you, you say you, you still may want to make your mom proud. That's great. Do you have any additional things you would like to add to that? Any things that you thought were reasons you joined and now maybe are different? And then I, t- I would tell them, it's like, hey, as you move through your career, ask yourself that every three months, every four months, whatever it may be, go back to that and like and check yourself. You're like, am, am I still in this for the same reasons? I joined the army to get out of my town for a better opportunity to go shoot machine guns and crawl through the dirt to be an infantryman. I joined for no other reason than those reasons. I stayed in for a completely different set of reasons, mm-hmm. you know? I think it's a pretty um, com- that's pretty I think it's more common than people admit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and when we take it back to these 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 surveys that we get in the military, ask some of those questions. Like, you know, like the ones that you just yeah. mentioned. Like ask that stuff because if you're if you're doing it in the name of readiness, you know, ask the questions that uh, you know that yeah. that that dial in, that focus on actual readiness. I agree. And you know, the, the other side to it too, is that it allows our senior people that are so far removed. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I I don't even see myself being that type of, at that level of a rank, because I think I would be miserable. I would be miserable. I am have I am struggling as a major right now because I'm not doing what I love. (laughs) I love being a battalion as one. Like I love being down with as close as I could to those, to those dudes that were going to be getting shot at, like and jumping in with them. Like I, it's hard for me as a major <laughs> to yeah. stay relevant. I couldn't imagine. Um, I couldn't imagine being up there with a star on your chest and trying to stay relevant. And um, that's why I, that's honestly, I, I made a post about this too. Like my mentorship is so important 
not just for the mentee, like not just for the the young person receiving information. It's so important for that mentor to stay connected with what the hell is going on. Yeah. Down, you know, honest conversations, raw conversations of like what what they're going through and what is really happening instead of staying so focused on what my experience was and I'm going to apply my experience Yes, that's important, but you also have to have some sort of a bridge between the experience of today, the experience of 2023 uh, with the position that you're in versus the experience of 2002. Yes, that's important, but that's, it's got to be like a 60-40, maybe a 60, (laughs) the 60 being 2023 experience. Yeah. So um, I used to work with a guy, he's a, he's a, Former fir- uh, first sergeant, and then he went warrant officer, and super intelligent guy, really great guy. And before Ty Reed and I recorded with uh, the force comp sergeant major, uh, sergeant major Sims, mm-hmm. um, he used to be our our first sergeant back in the day, and so that's how we kind of looked into that. And uh, so I asked him, I asked the guy that I used to work with, I was like, "Hey man, if there, if you had a sit down with the force comp sergeant major or somebody like that, like what's something that you would like to ask them that you thought maybe other people would be able to hear. And his one question, like right off the bat was, Oh, I always ask like, how do you make yourself more visible and relatable to the troops? And I was like, that's a really good question. Right. Cause you, you talk about like, whether it be the sergeant major of the army or the SMAR, sergeant major of the army reserves or a general or brigade commander or sergeant major or whatever, how are you making yourself available and visible to the troops? How are you able to get down on their level and and be able to relate to them and understand what they're going through uh, compared to when you went through that time frame? And when we recorded with Sergeant Major Sims, um, I never really asked that question directly because it kind of just came up in conversation. Yeah, and we're friends with them on Facebook uh, because you know we know him as a person. And he is constantly posting interactions with him and E4s and E3s, E2, E1s, young E5s, the people that are out there in these units doing the work, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's all, over the, all over the country going to these different locations, Polk and Irwin and, and uh, JBLM and Benning and wherever, or Fort Moore, all these other places. And he's saying he's talking to these troops. He's having conversations with them. He's going out and doing PT with them, going on three, five mile runs. The dude's been in, in the military for shit, 30 some odd years, right, Tyree? Like, yeah, he yeah. came in the, he was in, yeah, he was in the Marine Corps for, yeah. Nobody back in the day. Yeah. And he is still out there hard charging with these troops. And one, give, showing them the example of like what a great leader is supposed to be like. And then two, speaking to them. And mm-hmm. getting down to where they are doing the, I mean, you'll see, you'll see a, a post of him that, like down at Fort Polk with camo on and his full kit. And he's out there like talking to these, I don't know if he's right yeah. running through the training or not. You know what I mean? But like, he's, he's in it and he misses it. He loves it. Yeah. Right. But this is that, this is that guy that like genuinely gives a shit about what the troops are going through. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like jokers out there are fucking gladhead and the troops he actually cares and he was a really cool guy to be around like it rubs off yeah. you can mm-hmm. tell people who who were around yeah. him acted the same way and that's that's an awesome thing uh quick question though this is a here i am side side question mcgee over here kevin <laughs> you have a very cool t-shirt uh please explain what you're wearing for the people who are listening and watching on youtube yeah i had uh, the same question did you Oh. you were checking out my apparel um yeah. so yeah. <laughs> okay for those looking at me um and those of you who can't see me just go look at our youtube or something or maybe we'll make a post about it. i don't know but anyway so this is way off topic man <laughs> well, like i had to get it in there before i forgot man i'm sitting here looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> like fucking say something about the shirt the conversation was like 90 miles an hour down the highway and you're at a brick wall just ma'am tell me about that shirt <laughs> And here I am, man. Um, bring it up. No, uh, so okay, so uh, like Tyree mentioned uh, not too long ago, I think it was the other day, or by the time this show airs, a week, two weeks ago, um, we have a website. Uh, before I forget, thepodcast.com. Um, and there's 
stuff on there, videos and highlights and all this other stuff. Matter of fact, uh, Sydney, your um, the last recording we did with you is highlighted on there under the Women's oh, History cool. Month. Um, so that's on there. Nice. Um, but there's also some bios um, about Tyree and I. I wrote Tyree's. Tyree <laughs> had AI write mine. Hey, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> i cleaned Back it up in my man. day i had to write my own stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 come on you're outdated i did have to clean it up though because ai made me sound patriotic as fuck and don't be wrong i am but like it went to like the max bro like it was write my citations from now on for awards ai yeah. um <laughs> but like on that website, there's also a link. We have a store. The store is a separate website. Actually, it's called Before I Forget Podcast.com. But anyway, you can just oh, click the link and it has this. But like, so this shirt basically is one of a few that we have on there. And it says, if only one, right? And then below that, it says 988, right? Um, so if only one kind of goes back to what Tyree and I have talked about offline and a lot of times on the show too, to where like, whatever we may be talking about, you know, however many listeners we may have or viewers. If if you're struggling and you're going through hardship and you're walking that edge and you're 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 looking at like an alternative to life. <laughs> um if 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 listening to us or listening to the conversations that we have or listening to the people that we bring onto the show, because that's why we bring these people on the show to share their experiences and their life. And to show like, man, like if they can do it, I can do it, right? This is what they did. I'm going to implement that in my life and see if I can make change. If if only one person receives that message and and their life is changed or saved in some cases, then fuck, man, that's amazing. Obviously, we want more than one. We want all of you. We want everybody to to be in a great mental state and to to continue pushing through life and through those hardships. But fuck, man, if we can, if we can, if we can save just one, if only one. And so 988, right, um, is because I don't know if any, I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers and listeners may be aware, maybe not, but like the National Suicide Hotline used to be this big, long number that nobody could remember. And now you can just call 988 and that's all you need to remember, 988, just like 911. So you call 988 and you can get the help that you you need that way. Um, so that's where the, the idea for the shirt came from, uh, if only one and the 988, you can, it's on the website. Um, I will say I, I'm not entirely satisfied with, with using, we have to use a drop shipper as a, for, for the time being, because we're, we don't have a ton of money and so we can't create our own things. So we have to like use a drop shipper. So one, it takes a while for it to come to you. And two, um, I just, I don't know. I don't like using the drop. I don't like the prices that we had to put on there just because they charge an outrageous amount. It's a whole thing. Um, but it's, it's, it's the smallest that we could do in the time being or the biggest. I don't know. We're trying people. Um, doing, the best, doing the best we can. What we got. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's a way it has our logo on the back. Um, show the back. I'm not, yeah, not going to show the back because yeah. I have to give show up. The back. Okay, fine. God damn it. Show yeah. the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that purple or blue? It's infantry blue. Okay. It's, so it's blue. Just the coloring on my phone. Yeah. So it's blue. Or it's, it's my selfie light, like demolishing my eyes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's infantry blue and green. So um, it's well, it's so it's our logo. Um, which is uh, okay. the blue comes yeah. from he and I were blue spaders, and so that's where the blue spade comes from. We borrowed it. Um, thank you, yeah, one two six. We love you, yeah. and um, and and then yeah, it's a whole thing. But um, nice. But that's that's where this came from. There's other shit on there too. Um, uh, there's actually one design that I want to I want to tidy up, but um, it's, it has a quote from uh, was it Albert uh, Camus. Um, but in the end, it takes more strength to live. And I love that. I love that um, that thought process, right? Because you know, if 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 you've ever been to that point where you've planned it out or tried to follow through with it, like it is easy to it is easy to follow through with that. It is easy to 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 say this. Fuck, man, whatever's going on in my life, like this is 
I can't do it and I want to be away from it. And how do I remove myself from it? Well, I can't because wherever I go, my problems will follow me. So this is the easiest Mm -hmm. way out. And um, it really does take a lot of strength to try and carry on. And that's, that's, so that's where that comes from. But anyway, they're there. um, If people want to go look at them and, and whatever else. And that's it. Before I forget the podcast.com, you can find all of our bullshit right there. Yeah. Links will be in the description and shit. Hey, um, I want to go back to a question that uh, before the show, we were talking about Iceland, Sydney. Yeah. And um, you went there for how long were you there? Probably like 10 or 12 days. Not near. I said, I, no, I had super mushy brain. Like I was at my worst um, coming out of school, coming yeah. out of ranger school. So I finished finished school at the end of October and then uh, went to Iceland middle of November. So. Okay, so and then you were in Portugal for not too long and you want to spend the, the better part of a year there or more. Right. And so yeah. and I always have but this Prague, question. I don't know. Prague, Prague is on the is on the on the dartboard. Uh, Germany. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't think I don't see myself putting roots anywhere. <laughs> yeah, Bali. I'll go back to Bali for a year. Are you kidding me? So this is this is okay. So you, and 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 you've been places and you've been to these places mm-hmm. and you felt this like overwhelming like relief and this happiness, yeah. this joy and. And you're yeah. right. The food is better. The water is better. I mean, there's actual, I, yeah. I, I've read a ton of things about how all of that whole other thing. Anyway. Um, yeah. Oh, I've got like a two and a half foot filter on my sink that takes everything out of it. So, and I'll tell you what, maybe it's placebo, but I, I feel better and it tastes really good too. That's why I can't stop drinking it. it tastes good. There's no fluoride in it. There's nothing in it. So yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that being said, right. Okay. So with that being said, and, and we know, okay, if we live in America, right. We the freest country on the planet and yeah. we're allowed to have things and do stuff, right. We can, mm-hmm. we're, we're free as fuck. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so this is where I'm going. I mean, at. I'm in the military, man. I'm not free. <laughs> right. I don't know like, what that feels like. Exactly. Um, it's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So here's, 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 here's the question that I, that I often ask people, especially people who are like specifically gun owners, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you had the opportunity to live in a country that was really highly ranked in education, um, low, extremely low in crime, um, the, over, the general happiness of the community that lives there is just you know, through the roof, right? Everything just is better. Would you be willing to give up what you have here to live there? And I feel like I understand, I I might already know your answer, Sydney, because I feel like you have this Mm -hmm. like nomadic soul about you. Yeah. Um, Um, I keep hitting my freaking camera thing. Um, is it my? Am I? Am is it? Is it like for me to answer now, or do you have more to the question? Or no, go ahead, go ahead. Throw in. I think. What do you got? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would. I would give up guns for it. Well, not just guns, right? Because it's it's the entire America. culture, though, dude. Like, it's not. It's the entire. It's the whole culture, right? Like the American culture. <laughs> guns play a part in it. Um, when you're traveling to another country, you are entering a different culture, a, a different energy, a different. You're eating different food, right? And I say that because you're getting different chemicals in your body. Like there's different music, it's different language, it's it's all of it is different. And it's like, um, if you feel healthy and you feel happy and you feel like you can be your best version of yourself and be loving to others and be a positive contribution to the earth, um, you are assimilating into that culture. And um, I want to be respectful of that culture. So, you know, if I want to spend time in my life within a certain culture, because I want it to be influenced by it, I need to be all in. Uh, 
Agreed. So. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And so this is, that's, and that, so the question typically in my mind is, uh, relates to guns, right? Yeah. Um, because I think it was one of the many mass shootings that happened earlier this year or last year where the kind of the question kind of came up in my mind. I was having a conversation with somebody and I was like, I wonder, 